Chapter 6 Doris was awake early the following morning to bake bread and get ready for the morning ahead. It seemed strange, leaving Andrew asleep in bed, but she knew it was important that she fulfill her obligations. Andrew and Margaret had spoken and they'd decided that the Jeffersons could eat free two meals per day in trade, and they would also accrue two extra meals per week for whomever they wanted to eat with. As Doris popped loaves of bread into the oven, she couldn't help but let her mind drift to the previous night's events and the pleasure she'd received in Andrew's bed. No one had ever told her that a woman received pleasure from a man. She'd been led to believe that only the men would receive pleasure from the marital act. She worked on churning more butter while the bread baked, because it was a mindless activity that allowed her to continue daydreaming. When she heard Andrew go outside to milk the cows, she wondered how he was feeling. Hopefully he was as pleased as she was that their relationship had become physical. It took him as long to milk the cows as it did for her to bake all the loaves of bread they needed for the store and the boarding house. Carrying them in the same basket she had been, she wrapped each in cloth to get ready to go. When Andrew came inside, he looked at a bottle she'd filled with something. What's that? he asked. He was used to her taking bread and even butter, but she had a bottle of a strange milky substance. Butter milk, she replied. I think it may help Margaret. If not, I'll put it out for the pups. Sounds fine. He said nothing else as he carried the bread to the wagon for her, putting it into the back, before helping her into the wagon. Do you regret what happened last night? Doris asked as they started toward town. Andrew shook his head. No, I enjoyed it too much to regret it, and you are my wife. But I hope it doesn't make you think I can trust you fully, because I'm still not certain that's true. I understand, she said softly, though she wished things were different. With everything inside her, she wished she had the answer to what she could do to get him to trust her, but she decided it would just take time. He carried the basket of bread into the back door of the boarding house, with Doris right behind him. Do you have any use for buttermilk? Doris asked. We don't really use it, and I thought it might be helpful for you. Margaret nodded. Yes. I would like the buttermilk for my own purposes. Both girls and I love to drink it. Then I'll bring it every day. It's better than wasting it. Doris hoped that Andrew wouldn't try to get Margaret to trade something for it. She wanted this to be a gesture of friendship toward the younger woman. I would appreciate that. Andrew said nothing as they entered the dining room and sat down at the little table in the corner always reserved for them. Will it be more work for you to bring Margaret the buttermilk? Doris shook her head. Not really. I'll just have to keep up with a couple of milk bottles and keep them clean. There's nothing else involved. Good. I would like for the buttermilk to just be something between the two of you. I don't feel the need to trade or charge her for it. I was hoping that would be the case. I feel like Margaret was my first true friend here, and I wanted her to have something from me. A slight smile curved Andrew's lip. I'm glad we're thinking alike. It's nice, isn't it? Never had she dreamed she would marry a man who thought so much like her. It felt as if she'd walked into her own version of paradise. If only he could trust her, then everything would be perfect. At his nod, she grinned. I think I'm going to spend the day working on curtains. I've delivered the butter needed for the Jensen's, and Margaret is good. I can churn more in the morning while the bread is baking. I hadn't really realized how easy it would be to churn while baking. I feel like I've been wasting time my entire life. That sounds fine, he said. Is there anything around the farm you need my help with before I start on the curtains? She said a silent prayer that he would ask her to go with him and work with him that day. No, nothing I need help with. Make your curtains. Doris was a little sad he didn't want or need her with him, but Fiona had brought more vegetables that had to be put up. There was plenty of time to do the things she had to accomplish, and she would put her heart and soul into doing it. 
When they arrived home, she made a simple meal for lunch, not thinking he much cared what he ate for the noon meal. She had it on the table when he arrived home after working all morning, and they ate, mostly in silence. She had just finished the lunch dishes when someone pulled up in the yard. Looking out the window, she saw it was Fiona. Doris wiped her hands on her apron and went to the door. Hello, she called. Fiona jumped down from the wagon. I'm working on harvesting pumpkins and squash today. I know Pa doesn't eat squash, but he loves pumpkin pie. I thought you might like to come and help me harvest. Emma is spending a quiet day with Henri. Doris remembered the names Emma and Henri as Fiona's sisters-in-law. I'd love to. Jump in and let's go then. Fiona didn't bother to get down from the wagon seat. Should I bring a basket to harvest into? No need. I have plenty. Fiona grinned as Doris scrambled up beside her. Ma and I made lots of baskets last winter. We knew it would help us for the harvest this year. What a wonderful idea. Is that where all the baskets in the cellar came from? I feel like every time I turn around down there, I bump into another basket, Doris said, wondering about Fiona's mother. Perhaps Fiona would tell her about her if she wasn't too intrusive. The drive to Fiona's home was short, and Doris looked all around her. She was a little surprised when Melody joined them. I wasn't sure how much I'd see you outside of church, she said to the woman who had traveled with her from Independence. My stepson is married to your stepdaughter. I have a feeling we'll see each other a great deal. Melody looked out over the garden. I don't know why they thought they'd need so many pumpkins, but this isn't going to be a quick job to harvest them all. Fiona just told me that Andrew loves pumpkin pie, so I'm excited to harvest it. Maybe I can put up some pumpkin pie filling to have it for the whole winter ahead. I don't know if Jacob enjoys pumpkin pie, but I'd be happy to help, Melody replied. I saw you at the boarding house on Sunday evening. You should have come over and said hello. Doris said. We eat there every evening. You'll have to come as our guests one week. She briefly explained their arrangement for free meals to Melody. Oh, that sounds fun. The four of us should go sometime soon. They spent much of the afternoon picking squash and pumpkins. When it was almost five, and time for Doris and Andrew to go to the boarding house for their supper, Fiona drove Doris and eight large pumpkins home. Your father will want all of this made into pies? Doris asked. I do enjoy making pumpkin bread. He loves pumpkin bread as well. I wouldn't serve him just pumpkin, but bread and pies would thrill him. I'll do that then. I won't even offer to make extra for the store or the boarding house. I don't know how you manage to make all you do for them. I stay busy just being a wife and having my garden. Doris nodded. Next summer I'll have a garden, and I'll keep busier. Right now, I don't feel like I'm doing much of anything. How many loaves of bread do you bake for the store and the boarding house every day? Fiona asked. Just twenty, and then one for your father and me. I turn the butter while the bread is baking, and then I still have a whole day ahead of me. I was going to spend the afternoon sewing the curtains I cut out this morning, but I'm glad I got to help with your harvest instead. Doris planned to give some of the pumpkin pie filling she put up to Fiona to thank her for the help with the harvest. There are some wild berries growing out near the lake, Fiona said. I've been wanting to drive out and pick them, but it's a long drive, and Henri can't go, so Emma won't go. I don't want to go alone. Why don't you take Melody? Doris asked, though why she was unsure. She loved the idea of picking berries down by the lake. Fiona shrugged. She wants to be there when Henry's baby is born. I do too, but, I want to pick berries while they're ripe as well. Doris smiled. I'll pack your father a lunch to take with him tomorrow, and we'll go to the lake and pick all the berries we can find. Jams and jellies and pies, oh, I do love berries. Wonderful. I'll come to fetch you around seven? Sounds good. 
I'll pack us a lunch to share when I pack your pa's lunch for work. Thank you. Fiona said, looking excited at the prospect of spending the day picking berries. I'll need to be home by around five, Doris said. That's when your pa and I go to the boarding house for supper. I don't know why you don't just cook at home. I know you're a good cook, because pa told me. He likes to go to the boarding house, and I have to admit that Margaret is a better cook than me. Pa has spent his whole life saving every dime he can, and now he pays to eat somewhere twice per day. Your pa doesn't look at it as paying when he does it all in trade, Dora said, shaking her head. But if he's happy going there every day, then I'm happy to go with him. You're a very good wife to him. I'm glad you came through. I try really hard to be a good wife, Doris responded, not willing to say anything about the friction between herself and Fiona's father. Fiona pulled the wagon into the yard. Tomorrow, at seven, she reminded her stepmother. I'll be ready, Doris said. They were always home from breakfast by seven. She'd simply make sure to have lunches packed before they went to the boarding house. Fiona helped her carry the pumpkins inside and put them on the counter before she rushed off to make supper for her own husband. Doris didn't need to make supper, so she waited for Andrew to be finished in the parlor, where she kept working on the curtains she'd started. When Andrew came in, he looked exhausted. Are you sure you don't want me to fix something here? she asked. He shook his head. No, we'll go. Are you feeling all right? Doris asked as she followed Andrew to the wagon. I'm fine. Just got too hot today. It happens even this far north. It'll cool off soon, Doris said. Her favorite thing about Clover Creek so far is it could get very hot during the day in the summer, but it always cooled down at night. When they reached the boarding house, Doris was excited to see what Margaret had fixed for supper, and to her surprise, it was venison stew. It was all Doris could do not to jump for joy. I didn't think you'd ever make this, Doris said. She'd been close to sending Andrew out hunting for a deer, so she could make it. It was just as good as she'd imagined, and she sighed as she took the first bite. When she looked up she saw that Andrew was watching her. Sorry, this is just one of my favorite foods, and I haven't had it since I was a child. He smiled. That didn't make sense when you first said it, but now that I know you didn't marry, it does. I'm glad you like it so much. I could truly eat this for every meal. I'm going to be as round as a ball if we keep eating here twice per day, she said, though she'd never really had any problems with her weight. He shrugged. I won't mind. For the first time, Doris asked for more food at the boarding house that night. I could take gallons of this home and never be satisfied, she told Margaret. Glad to hear you say that, Margaret said. When she came back with a bowl of stew, her husband was behind her with a large jar filled with the stew. This is for all you do for us. Doris held back the squeal that wanted to come out. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Margaret disappeared to help her other guests, while Doris dug into the next bowl of stew. I'll serve this for lunch the day after tomorrow, Doris said. Andrew frowned. Not tomorrow? Oh. I forgot to tell you. Fiona and I are going to the lake tomorrow, to pick berries. I see. Somehow he didn't seem thrilled she was going to spend the day with his daughter. Is that all right? she asked, surprised. I've gotten used to having lunch with you at the house every day, he said softly. I'll make you a lunch. But if I can pick berries, we can have jams and pies for the winter. He nodded. I know. Doris was astonished. He was going to miss her. It was the first indication he'd given that he really enjoyed spending time with her. Maybe it was good she wouldn't be home all day for a change. Do you want me to cancel? Andrew shook his head. No, that's all right. I do like the idea of having some berry pies this winter. I helped pick pumpkins all day, she said softly. 
I'll be putting up pumpkin pie filling by the end of the week, and I thought I could make some pumpkin bread. He grinned. You can spend time with Fiona any time you'd like. Chapter 7 The next day was great fun for Doris. She'd worked hard her entire life, and it felt good to be outside working again. Fiona was feeling chatty, and she talked about her mother some while Doris took mental notes of everything said. I'm sure you miss her terribly, Doris said. Oh, I do. I wasn't sure she'd make the journey all the way to Oregon City and back to here, but she did. And then she died when we were settled here. I can't imagine anything harder than losing my mother. The two of you were close? Oh, yes. We were close before the trail, but after walking that far with her, and having her as my closest companion, it was so much harder to lose her. When she and Pa fell ill last winter, I worried I'd lose them both, but Pa pulled through. I did all the milking for two weeks, but it was enough for him to get better. The day he went back to work is the day we lost Ma. I blamed myself for a while, and I know Pa blamed himself for not being there, but she was so sick, and she was so tired. I think it was a blessing that she died when she did. She wasn't unhappy, was she? The little Doris had heard about Nelita had always been positive. It was hard to believe she hadn't been happy. Oh, yes, she was happy. We worked so hard to prepare for the winter, so we'd have the food we needed, and Pa promised her a new house this summer. She got weaker the further west we came. Fiona shook her head. It still seems so strange to me that she's gone, but I know those last six months, she was barely hanging on. She worked hard, despite how she was feeling. She sounds like she was a perfect wife and mother. No one's perfect, Fiona said. She had a bit of a temper and would get angry when I didn't learn to do something properly the first time. And she got frustrated with Pa. Always called him a skinflint. Far from perfect, but she was the Ma I needed to grow into the person I am today. She and your Pa were happy together? Doris asked. Oh, they were. Pa would bring her special rocks he found while he was out during the day. He always wanted to farm, but where we lived back east, he worked in a factory. He's a lot happier here, even without Ma. Did you ever lie to your parents growing up? Fiona shook her head. Not after the first time. Pa was so angry with me, I'm surprised I can sit down today. Lying is not something he'll ever tolerate. Doris felt worse than ever. It sounded like she'd done the absolute worst thing she could have done in her husband's eyes. You must miss living with them. In some ways I do, Fiona said. But I love the freedom I have as a wife. Sam is very soft-spoken, and if I tell him it will help us for me to do something, then he's always happy for me to do it. It's funny sometimes, just how much he agrees with me. I don't take advantage of him, but I could if I wanted to. I'm glad you don't take advantage of him, Doris said as she dropped a few more of the berries into her basket. What kind of berries are these anyway? They're a form of huckleberry, but I'm not sure which. I know they're safe to eat, but they tend to be very bitter. They need lots of sugar to make them taste good. Well, we'll see what kind of pie they make. Or jam. Or both. The berries are so small, it seems to be taking forever to pick a decent amount of them. It does, Fiona agreed. I think it would be better if we could mix them with other berries, but all of the wild ones except these were ripe earlier in the season. The gooseberries here are wonderful. I have several jars of gooseberry jam at home. That sounds good. Oh, you have some in your cellar that I picked for Pa last month. I'm sure he hasn't eaten at all. He probably hasn't had any. I worked hard to keep his cellar stocked with food, but he never really cared to touch it. Fiona shook her head. He lost his appetite after Ma died. I'm glad to see he's gaining back a little of the weight he lost now that he's married to you. I hadn't noticed. I hope I'm helping him gain his weight back. 
I know he prefers to eat at the boarding house for most meals. I am a good cook though. I swear I am. Fiona laughed. He said you were. I think he's just set in his ways, and he wants to do things the way he has since I married. It seems to give him comfort to have the same routine all the time. That makes sense. He does seem to be a creature of habit. I'm surprised he was willing to travel the Oregon Trail, where everything would be different. I was too in some ways, but I don't think he thought of the trail as a big change in his life. He's always dreamed of working for himself as a dairy farmer, and it was the only way he could see to fulfilling his dream. I think that makes sense. Doris wasn't sure if that would have worked for her, but she wasn't the one who had problems with change. You just have to look past his eccentricities, to the good man he is under them all, Fiona said with a grin. I am glad you two married. I think it'll be good for both of you. It certainly has been for me, Doris said. On the long drive back to town, Doris asked more personal questions about Andrew. What's your pa's favorite food? Fiona shrugged. Pa is easy. As long as he has meat and potatoes, he's a happy man. You said he doesn't like squash, Doris said. Yes, he likes meat, potatoes, bread, and desserts. He will pick vegetables out of soups, and if you're looking for a vegetable he'll eat, it's better to just give up. Doris smiled. My pa was the same way. Then it shouldn't be hard for you to cook for pa. I'm sure he's thrilled with whatever you do though. He seems to be very fond of you. Fond? Yes, he did seem to be fond of her. But she wanted him to love her. She hoped she hadn't already messed her marriage up where love could never happen. She was home just in time to go to supper with Andrew, and he had already hitched the wagon when she and Fiona pulled into the yard. Fiona waved her on. Go to supper. I'll put the berries in the kitchen for when you're ready. Thank you. Surprising herself, Doris embraced the girl. You have no idea how much help you've given me today. Thank you. Fiona grinned. I was happy to have someone willing to go berry picking with me. Doris got into the wagon with Andrew. He glanced at her. Looks like you got a little burned by the sun, he said, nodding to her face. Didn't you wear your bonnet? She laughed. I kept taking it off, because it made me hot. I guess I did that one time too many, and got too much sun. It would seem so. He shook his head. You're a great deal like Fiona. Always ready for your next adventure. Is that a bad thing? she asked. No, I don't think so. It just surprises me, because you seem so hardworking. If you don't think picking huckleberries all day is hard work, then you don't know what hard work is. And then I'll take the berries and make jam out of them. Women's work is different from men's work, but it's still hard work. Andrew nodded. I suppose you're right. I'm always willing to help with the milking or any other farm task, she said. You just have to let me know. I appreciate that, he said. He still spoke a lot less than he had before she'd admitted her deceit to him. After supper, he took the long way home, pointing out different places in town, including the doctor's office and the blacksmith's shop. He showed her where the kings had their furniture business. It's a good town. I can't imagine that I would have been as comfortable anywhere else. I'm glad this is where you ended up then. Was your wife happy here? she asked. He looked at her for a moment. Nelita? Sure, she was happy here. Anywhere with Fiona, and I would have made her happy. I wish she'd lived long enough to see Fiona married. That would have truly made her happy. I'm really sorry you lost her. Thank you. She was my wife for twenty years. My life would have been very different without her by my side. Finally, he pulled into their yard. Get your dough mixed for tomorrow, he said. I'm going to work on something in the barn for a bit. What are you working on, she asked, wondering if he'd be willing to tell her. 
Nothing much, he said. Doris went into the house, wondering why he was keeping secrets from her. Was it because she'd deceived him unintentionally? She wished there was some way for her to make amends and for him to start trusting her again. She went inside and got the dough mixed and taken to the cellar. When she came back up the stairs, she could hear him walking through the house. Andrew, she called, wondering where she could find him. In here, he called. She followed his voice to his bedroom, where he was getting ready for bed. I'm tired too, she told him. I haven't spent that much time outside since I got to Clover Creek. He smiled, reaching out for her. Are you too tired? She chuckled. I enjoy what we do too much to be too tired. Good, he said, lowering his mouth to hers. Not much was said for a long while after. The next two days were spent making and putting up jam and putting up the pumpkin pie filling. To surprise Andrew, Doris baked a loaf of pumpkin bread for him, hoping he'd be as happy as Fiona had thought he would be. She served the bread as part of their lunch on Friday, and at first, Andrew poked at it with his knife instead of buttering it. What's in it? he finally asked. It's pumpkin bread, she said. You'll love it. He looked skeptical as he buttered the sliver of a piece he'd cut for himself. She could see he was only eating it so he wouldn't hurt her feelings, which she couldn't complain about one whit. He took a bite of the bread and his whole face lit up. This is delicious. Dora smiled, thrilled he liked it. I'm glad you like it. I packed a few pieces in your oilcloth bag so you can take it for a snack this afternoon. Why do you do such wonderful things for me? he asked. She shrugged. I thought you'd like it so I made it. I'm surprised you're being so kind when I know you are worried about the future of our marriage. Dora swallowed hard, trying to find the right words. As long as I am your wife, I will make you as happy as I can. If you decide to send me on with the next wagon train, I'll go without complaint. And it was true. Though she had few things that she would need, her wagon was still parked next to camp. She could jump in it and leave any time she wanted to. Or whenever he told her to, as the case may be. Do you want to leave? he asked. Dora shook her head. I'm happy as your wife, and I want to do as much for you as I can. I hope someday, you will be proud to call me your wife instead of always so disappointed. He sighed. I'm not disappointed in you, Doris. I want you to understand that I care for you deeply. I am just having a hard time getting past the lie. Do you want to send me away? She asked. He shook his head. No, I don't. I would never get a divorce. But, I can't fully trust you yet either. It's something we're going to have to work through together. Doris nodded. I understand. And she did to some extent. But if she'd found out something he'd lied about, she never would have held it against him this way. She'd have found a way to keep loving and trusting him. When the word love came into her mind, she wanted to reject it, but she couldn't because she knew it was true. She was in love with Andrew Jefferson, even though he couldn't trust her. Maybe someday he'd be able to. When he left that afternoon to head back to work, she washed the dishes and then went to work on the curtains she'd started. She wanted curtains and a tablecloth to match. It would make her feel so much more at home, and she said a silent prayer it would make him feel at home as well. She wanted his love and respect, and she wasn't sure she'd ever get it. While Andrew worked that afternoon, his mind was constantly on Doris. Yes, she'd lied to him, but she'd told him as soon as she could. And she was a good wife, helping him to make money and feeding him things she knew he'd find special. He wasn't sure he'd ever be able to trust her completely, but he felt like he'd done the right thing by marrying her. He was happier with her around. He wasn't ready to go so far as to say he loved her yet, and he wouldn't until he trusted her completely. Hopefully that would be very soon. She was a hard worker, and that was obvious. 
She didn't have a great deal to do around the house since they ate out two meals per day, so she worked for others to occupy her time. And she was very willing and ready in bed. Oh, how he'd missed that special part of his relationship with Nelida. Doris was slowly taking his late wife's place. It was time for him to start trusting her if at all possible. He prayed that it would come quickly, because she was the woman he needed in his life. Chapter 8 By the 1st of October, the harvest was done, and all of the vegetables had been put up, ready to use when Doris needed them. But that gave her even less to do on a daily basis. In her spare time, she started quilting. She had no one to make a quilt for, but she wanted to sleep under a quilt made by her own hands and not by Nelita. So she did all her chores in the morning and in the afternoons, she worked on quilting. The puppy, whom she'd decided to name Storm, still wasn't quite ready to join her in the house, so she visited him in the mornings as well, hoping that he would understand that she was his human. She talked to Fiona, who told her that Andrew's favorite color was blue, and he liked red a lot as well. So she bought yards of red and blue fabric and started to create the quilt she wanted them to sleep under. On Wednesday afternoons, she went to the quilting circle at the church and got to know many of the women in a way she couldn't before and after church services. She felt herself especially drawn to Mrs. Mitchell, the midwife who had once called the Oregon Trail a death march. She had many children of her own, and they were close to the same age. Doris respected the other woman as she talked of her family and how she'd given up everything to come west to follow a dream her husband had but she'd never shared. Mrs. Mitchell was a new grandmother, sometimes having the baby with her at the quilting circle, because her daughter, Mary, had gone off hunting. Does your daughter hunt often? Doris asked as she carefully stitched. Mrs. Mitchell nodded. She was my only for several years, and her father took her out hunting, fishing, and doing whatever he thought was fun. She's more comfortable with a musket than she is with a pot, but I made sure she could cook as well. And she's always had to help mind her younger siblings. Mary's a good daughter, but she outshoots her husband, and he seems to respect her for it. Doris laughed. She sounds very interesting. I'm sorry I haven't had time to get to know her yet. She is definitely interesting. Mrs. Mitchell looked down at the beautiful little girl she was holding. I'm a little afraid she's going to raise this little angel to be just like her mother, but I'll love her no matter what. Hannah, the pastor's wife, moved over to sit near them. She tried to spend at least a little time talking to everyone in the quilting circle every week. Are you talking about Mary? Hannah asked, smiling. I am, Mrs. Mitchell said. She tried to turn you into a musket-carrying woman as well. She did try and I'm so thankful to her that I know how to shoot a musket and do so many other things that aren't exactly womanly. I don't think she changed me in any way. Oh, you were a good girl to begin with. Not like my Mary. Mrs. Mitchell shook her head. Hannah laughed delightedly. I love your daughter and consider her one of my very closest friends. I know. It was the most Doris had ever heard the preacher's wife say and she was happy to get to know her a little better. Did you come west with everyone else? Hannah nodded. My stepfather all but sold me to Jed, and I was very unhappy at first, but it didn't take long for me to realize what a truly good man I'd married, and I was very happy to be his wife. That's wonderful, Doris said. What about your first husband? Hannah asked. Doris spent a moment contemplating what she should say and she finally said, I've never been married before. I pretended to be a widow, to keep unwanted attentions away on the trail. I never meant to continue the lie here, and I must say, I'm incredibly sorry that anyone ever believed I was married before. Hannah smiled, nodding. I understand completely. Many of the women in this room have pasts they're not proud of. So you don't think less of me? Doris asked, surprised the preacher's wife would be so casual about such a big lie. Of course not. I'm assuming you've told Mr. Jefferson the truth? 
At Doris's nod, Hannah continued. As far as I'm concerned, it's between the two of you and no one else's business. If you two can work it out, then all is good in the world. I've never met a preacher's wife who found it so easy to forgive someone for lying the way I did. I don't think I'm like most preacher's wives. At least I hope I'm not. I just try to be open-minded and understand people and where they're coming from. And I support my husband with everything inside me. That's wonderful. I'm trying to do the same. I've heard about the baking you're doing to help Margaret. I don't know how she's going to manage in another month when that baby is born, Mrs. Mitchell said, changing the subject. I don't either. Doris shook her head. I do what I can to help, but it won't be enough. Oh, it will, Hannah said. Many of us are already discussing which day will take over for her. Fiona, who was behind Doris, said, I'm taking Mondays and Thursdays. I think it'll be good for me to be out of the house two days a week. Then I can forget about my morning sickness. It was the first Doris had heard about morning sickness. Are you expecting? she asked excitedly. At Fiona's nod, she continued, Oh, I've always wanted to be a grandmother. I do hope you'll let me help with the baby. Fiona smiled. Of course. I haven't told Pa yet, but I plan to when we all go to supper on Sunday evening. He's going to be so excited, Doris said. She knew her husband loved being a father, and she couldn't imagine how happy he'd be to be a grandfather. Fiona laughed. Just don't tell him yet. I wouldn't. Doris's mind returned to Margaret. Do you think she'd let me take a day cooking? I'd be happy to help her. I think she'd be thrilled, Fiona said. I know Hannah is taking a day, I'm taking two, Trudy will take a day, and with you, that's five days covered. She'll only have to find two more people to help. I'd even take two days if it would help more, Dora said. I love to cook, and I only get to cook lunches, because Andrew loves going to the boarding house so much. Oh, then she'd only have one day left to fill. I think Emma would be happy to take that last day, and then she wouldn't have to worry as she took a few weeks off to be with her children and recover from childbirth. I can't wait to tell her. Margaret was across the circle. As much as she worked, she tried to make it to the quilting circle every week. Fiona looked across the quilt to the other side of the room. Margaret. Margaret turned with a sweet smile. Yes? Doris is going to take two days, and I'm going to talk Emma into taking one. That will fill your week. Margaret looked confused for a moment, and then her eyes widened. Oh, that would be wonderful. Are you sure you don't mind? she asked Doris. Not at all. I love to cook, and you're so good at it that I never get a chance. Margaret laughed softly. I'm very happy for the help. When Fiona drove Doris home that afternoon, Doris was excited to tell Andrew what she'd agreed to. He may not like it, but he would definitely understand she wanted to help others. On their way to supper that evening, Doris sat close beside Andrew, drinking in his warmth. I'm going to work at the boarding house for two days per week while Margaret is recovering from childbirth, she told him. Really? Are you getting paid? he asked. I don't think so. And I wouldn't accept it if she offered. I just want it to be my gift to her and the baby. Andrew smiled. You are a very giving woman, Doris. I try to do things to help others that I know they need. I've already crocheted a blanket for the baby. She so wanted to tell him that he was going to be a grandfather, but she wouldn't betray Fiona's trust that way. Since I'm too old to have babies, I think I'll just help everyone in town who has one. Then I can hold babies and feel like I've had time with children. He smiled and nodded. My Nelita did that as well. She always wanted a dozen children, but we were only able to have Fiona. I'm sorry, Dora said, understanding, completely. I never thought I'd be a spinster until I was 45. I always dreamed of having a big family. 
Do others in town know you were a spinster? I just told Hannah Scott today. Well, she and Mrs. Mitchell, and I'm pretty certain Fiona heard as well. I think it's time I came clean with everyone. I think so as well, he said smiling at her. Thank you for telling people. No problem. I never meant for the lie to follow me in my new life. It was just to keep me safe on the trail. I can understand that, he said softly. And all at once, he did understand her reason for lying. He definitely didn't want to hear another lie cross her lips, but he knew he needed to trust her again. Truthfully, she'd done nothing so terribly wrong that he should worry. Margaret looked both exhausted and happy when she came to their table with their glasses of milk. Thank you for agreeing to help with the boarding house while I'm out with the baby. I'm having everyone come one day next week so I can show them how I do things. I'll be here. I can't pay more than 25 cents per day. Will that be all right? No, Doris said. I won't take anything from you. I'm just happy to help. Oh, I couldn't ask you to do that. You're not asking. I'm telling you that's what I'm doing. It's my way of saying thank you for being my first friend in Clover Creek. Margaret had tears in her eyes as she hurried off to get their suppers for them. You're a good woman, Doris Jefferson, Andrew said. I don't think I realized just how good you are until today. I'm doing what I would want someone to do for me, Doris responded. There are so many babies being born here, and I want to do what I can to help each and every new mother. He reached across the table and covered her hand with his. I'm proud to call you my wife. As he hadn't touched her in public since she'd confessed her lie to him, she was thrilled that he was holding her hand now. I'm proud to call you my husband. For the first time since she had told him, it felt as if their marriage could actually work in a way that they would both be happy for the rest of their lives. She looked down at the table, fearing he would see the tears that had popped into her eyes. She didn't want him to see her cry. She only wanted him to love her as much as she loved him. On the drive home that night, he held her close, and after she'd finished her baking that evening, they made love. While they made love often, this time it felt as if he'd truly forgiven her for her wrongdoing. It was different, and so was he. As they snuggled together to sleep, Doris realized that she was the luckiest woman in the world. Her husband had forgiven her, and she was going to rejoice that he had for the rest of her life. One lie had caused her so much grief that she promised herself she would never lie again, even if it meant being protected from anything. No, she would be truthful every day for the rest of her life. By Sunday, Doris was so excited for Andrew to find out about the baby, she could barely contain herself. At church, she was thinking about the baby as she whispered to Fiona she had to tell her father soon. I'm going to explode if he doesn't find out. Fiona laughed. I'm telling him tonight. I sure hope he just feels happy when I tell him and not old. My father is not an old man. No, he's not, Doris agreed, thinking of the way the man made love to her. He was anything but old. They all sat in the parlor before going to supper that evening, when Fiona interrupted the men's talk about weather. Why did men always seem to feel the need to talk about weather? and what it may bring, when there was nothing they could do about it. Pa? Fiona said. Andrew turned from his conversation with Sam. Yes? You're going to be a grandpa in the spring. Andrew stared at his daughter for a moment, before a slow smile spread across his face. I can't wait to hold my grandbaby. Sam grinned. I've been waiting for her to tell you. We were hoping you'd make the cradle. I would happily make the cradle. Andrew said. You don't want to? Sam shook his head. I could, but it would mean so much more to Fiona if you did it. Andrew smiled as he looked at his daughter and son-in-law. They were making him a grandfather. And he loved and trusted his sweet wife more than he could express. His life which had felt as if it was ending just nine months before, felt as if it was the most wonderful life on earth.
Between Doris and Fiona, he was as happy as a clam. Doris grinned. I know I'm not your real mother, but I will be the best grandma I can possibly be. I even started a crocheted blanket for the baby. Andrew looked at his wife. You knew and didn't tell me, he was surprised she could keep a secret of that magnitude. I promised her I wouldn't on Wednesday when she told me. I don't think I could have kept it in for much longer though. We're going to be grandparents. Doris couldn't have been more excited if it had been a natural grandchild. She would have a baby to love, and that's all she had ever truly wanted. Chapter 9 By the time Margaret had her baby a few weeks later, Doris was feeling more settled in her marriage with Andrew. Sure, he'd never said he trusted her, but he acted as if he did. And though the word love was never spoken, she fell more in love with him daily. She only hoped his feelings were the same. Working at the boarding house two days per week meant getting up even earlier than she had been. Getting up at three in the morning felt ridiculous, but she would do what she could to help her friend. Margaret had given birth to a boy, and they'd named him Alexander, which was quickly shortened to Alex. On a Friday morning in late November, Margaret brought her son to the boarding house with her, planning to visit with Doris on her last day of cooking all the meals for the boarding house. He's beautiful, Doris said. Margaret smiled. We certainly think so. Her girls were sitting quietly at the table, drawing pictures. Margaret had provided the menus for the time she would be out, and that morning, Doris was making scrambled eggs, biscuits, and gravy. While she talked to Margaret, she was cooking enough food for the 30 people they would have for breakfast. The boarding house hadn't opened for breakfast yet, but it would in just a few minutes. Doris had enjoyed working there, but she was pleased she was almost finished. She wanted to start making the Christmas gift she'd chosen for Andrew. And there were so many things she wanted to make for Fiona's baby. As she fixed the plates for the first of the boarders, Doris listened to Margaret talk about the baby. He has the best temperament. I think he's going to do fine lying in a cradle here in the kitchen while I work. It sounds like you've figured everything out, Doris responded. Give me a moment to get these first plates out. She balanced four plates on her arms and hurried out of the kitchen, distributing the plates where she could, and then she hurried back for the coffee pot and walked around filling coffee cups. Back in the kitchen, she started on the second batch of eggs. The biscuits were made, and there was enough gravy for the entire meal. It was just making sure she always made fresh eggs. For the rest of the day, Doris was in and out of the kitchen, being both the cook and the waitress. She'd gotten to know so many of the people in town by working for Margaret that she already felt as if she was one of Clover Creek inhabitants. Margaret watched her girls and fed the baby on and off during the two-hour breakfast shift. You act as if you've done this all your life, Margaret said, admiring Doris. I've cooked all my life. I haven't cooked in this volume or ever served so many people, but it seems to come naturally. Just don't open a restaurant, Margaret joked. I don't need the competition. I wouldn't be competition for you, Doris responded. Everyone in town is still asking when you'll be back. I feel as if I'm falling short every day. That's not true. They want me back because they're used to me. Doris knew better, but she felt no need to argue with her friend. Supper today is roast beef, mashed potatoes with gravy, and carrots. I'll serve fresh bread and butter with it. Margaret smiled. Everyone loves roast beef night. I'm thankful for all the help you've given me. Are you sure I can't pay you for all the work you've done? Doris shook her head. No, you can't. Working for you has helped me to get to know people in town, and I've learned how to cook for much larger groups of people. Skills that must be useful in the future. Especially if Fiona has the dozen children she told me she wanted. Margaret laughed and shook her head. I would never turn down a blessing from God in the form of a child, but a dozen feels like a few too many. My three will be hard enough to juggle. 
Doris nodded, hurrying out of the kitchen to serve more plates of food and top up people's coffee. She'd been washing dishes as they returned, so she was almost done for the morning. Would you mind if I tried to do supper on my own tonight? Margaret asked. I want to see if I'm ready to work again, and I'm itching to get behind that huge stove and cook. I wouldn't mind at all. Doris said. I wouldn't mind coming here and working with you tonight as well. No, I want to try to do it on my own. All right. We'll be here at five as we are every evening. If you need help, just let me know, and I'll be here. Margaret smiled. Andrew must be thrilled to have a wife who is so willing to give of herself. Doris just smiled at that. There were no words to express how complicated her marriage had become. After breakfast, Doris hurried out to Andrew, who had been waiting for her. She had eaten her own breakfast in the kitchen and between all the work she had to do. It seemed to work well. Margaret is going to do the supper service on her own tonight, Doris said as she pulled on her coat. She thinks she's ready. Andrew smiled. So I get my wife back? Doris laughed. I think I managed to take care of both you and the boarding house. Oh, you did. I just like knowing you're at home while I'm out on the farm. He put his arm around her as they walked out to the wagon. So what will you do with all your spare time? I'm working on so many different sewing projects that I will not be bored if that's what you're asking. Fiona asked for help with the baby's clothes and she was almost finished with the quilt she was making for their bed. She was certain Andrew had noticed it, but he'd yet to say a word. On the drive back to the farm, Doris thought about all the things she should do that day. Now that she had most of it free. Do you mind having leftover stew from yesterday for lunch? I never mind. It's always so much better than the jerky I took out for myself. I'm going to do some hunting today. Most of my projects for fair weather are done for the year, and the cows are in the barn. There's no need for me to keep trying to find things to do. Hopefully, I'll have some game for you to put up tomorrow. Doris nodded. That would be nice. She was still thinking about venison stew. As good as Margaret's had been, Doris wanted the venison stew she remembered. Try for a deer. He chuckled. If I get a deer, will I eat venison stew for a solid week? More like a month, Doris said, teasing him. It's a good thing I like venison stew then, isn't it? I'll serve it with biscuits, she said, trying to entice him. I'll get a deer if I can. I'd never had elk before coming here, but elk jerky became one of my favorite things. Mrs. Williams will let me take her an elk, she'll process it and take 10% of the jerky for her family as payment. I don't know what she does differently than everyone else in town, but her jerky is more tender and more flavorful than any other. It sounds like she's a wonderful cook, Doris said. She wasn't very good at making jerky herself. Andrew laughed. Worst cook in town. The only thing she makes well is jerky, but she's very good at making jerky. Huh. Doris was surprised. Let's have her do it then. I'm not good at it myself. I'd never even attempted to make jerky before the trail, and then I never felt like I got it just right. I think that's perfect. And we're helping others at the same time because we're giving them food for the winter. I'm glad we both agree that helping others is important, Doris said. Many people don't even think to help. It's important in a community like this. It helps people to be able to trade. Margaret couldn't make a profit if she had to pay for the bread, milk, and butter. Same with the store. But when we offer a trade, making a profit becomes easier for them. And it helps us as well. She'd never really thought about trading services as being helpful to both people before. She thought it was just because Andrew kept his purse strings tighter than most. Exactly. I wouldn't be willing to eat at the boarding house 14 meals a week if I was paying. They charge 15 cents a meal. But since I trade with milk, it works out beautifully. 
The only way I make real money is with the dairy, but I need little, because of the way I trade for everything. Even the lumber in this house was traded for. I gave them milk, and they gave me lumber. I'm still paying off the lumber with milk, but they have said a bottle a day for five years would be enough. I can do that. It sounds like everyone in town does pitch together to make things happen. We got used to helping each other on the trail. And now that we're a community instead of a company, Pastor Jed encourages us to always help others. At this time last year, he gave a sermon I'll never forget. He told us to look around the congregation and find someone with a need. They didn't have to ask or say they had a need. It was our responsibility to find them. And then help them fill that need. I like that. Doris had never heard of a preacher doing that, but she loved it. It worked very well. My family and I adopted a young widow and her four children. We made them supper every day for the winter. Fiona delivered them all. She also spent one afternoon a week in their home minding the children so the mother could have time with friends. We'll have to pick a family this year. Has that woman remarried? Doris asked. Not that I know of, Andrew responded. She was able to grow a garden this year, and her oldest son was out hunting a lot. I'm not sure they need anything, but I'd be happy to ask. Do that. I'd be more than happy to help her if she needed it. And then her mind drifted to others. There were so many in the community with needs. Perhaps you can shoot two elk, and we can share half the jerky we get with others who are short of food. Perfect. And that helps the Williams even more. He stopped the wagon in front of the house. I'm going to unhitch the wagon and see what I can get today. I've never been much of a hunter, but living here, you need to be. Wouldn't it be easier if you hunted with a friend? That way you wouldn't have to carry the animal back here on your own. Not a bad idea. I'll go see if Sam is free. Watching Andrew drive off for a moment, Doris couldn't believe how much she loved the man. She couldn't imagine her life without him after a short three months of marriage. He was a good man through and through. In the house, she put the leftover stew on one corner of the stove to heat slowly, and she brought the shirt she was making him into the kitchen to finish the hemming. She'd noticed his shirts were wearing out, and she loved sewing so much. It just made sense to her to make him shirts for Christmas. Well, shirts and the quilt that would cover them. Then she realized that was a way she could help others. She could sew shirts in different sizes and gift them to men who were wearing worn shirts but had no family to make them. The store sold no pre-made clothes, so there was a definite need in the community. She hid the shirt as soon as it was finished. She'd wrap it in brown paper and put it out for him for Christmas. By lunchtime, she'd done some more of the quilting, and she was pleased with the progress there. Soon, they would sleep under a quilt she had made instead of the one he'd shared with Nelita. As much as he cared for his first wife, he had to understand that his second wife needed things around that she'd done and could be proud of. Both Sam and Andrew were there for lunch. We got an elk, Andrew said, beaming with pride. I shot it, but I never would have gotten it down the mountain without Sam. That's wonderful, Doris said as she set another place at the table for Sam. Just one more elk and some venison for today then. Sam laughed. You're expecting a lot of us. There is a lot of wildlife here, Doris countered. It shouldn't be a problem for the two of you. She sat down to enjoy the meal with them. Will you take the elk straight to Mrs. Williams? After lunch, we will, Andrew said. I can't wait to eat that jerky. Sam nodded. Mrs. Williams makes the best jerky around. Don't eat anything else she tries to give you. Doris thought then it might be a nice gesture to take some meals to the Williams family. They must not be eating well. What does the family eat? she asked. Oh, they have meals. They just don't taste good. She burns everything. Henri has given the girls of the family cooking lessons, 
and they try to cook every meal now, but sometimes Mrs. Williams insists. Sam shook his head. They're wonderful people, but Mrs. Williams can't cook to save her life. Except jerky, Dora said. Except jerky, Sam agreed. And no one makes jerky that's half as good as Mrs. Williams. It's like she only has the capacity to cook one thing well, so she settled on jerky. I'm just glad she's willing to process what we take her into jerky and only keep a small amount for her own family. It makes things so much easier. I'm glad her daughters can cook then. So are they, Sam said with a grin. Andrew just grinned. He was proud of himself for getting the elk, but even more proud of his Doris. She was a good cook and a pleasant wife. He couldn't imagine anyone else who could have fit into his established life and completed him so perfectly. Chapter 10 Christmas came quickly. Doris had finished two shirts for Andrew, but she had a pile of others, all wrapped in brown paper with the size written on the outside of the package. On Christmas Eve, they went to church leaving Storm in the barn as he had a habit of destroying things when they weren't home. Doris had all the shirts in the back of the wagon, more than twenty total, over a large range of sizes. At the Christmas Eve service, held after sundown on Christmas Eve, Pastor Jed talked about the birth of Christ and the sacrifice he made for humanity. And then he talked about giving. I'd like to see everyone in this congregation choose a family to give to or help this winter. Do you know of a widow who lives alone? She may need food. If not, she may need companionship. Even if you can't afford to help others in a physical way, could you spend time with those young children who have lost their father? Could you let their mother go out for a few hours one day a week, just so she can get a break from being both father and mother? Everyone here needs something, and most don't have the courage to ask. Or they have too much pride to ask. I'm not asking you to judge them on their pride. I'd like to see everyone helping someone else in any way they can. After the sermon, they served hot chocolate and cookies that had been made by various ladies in the church. While they enjoyed the fellowship, Doris kept her eyes open for boys and men who could use new shirts. Andrew went back and forth from the wagon for her a good ten times as she distributed her gifts to people of the Bear Lake Valley, each of them shocked to receive a gift and sorry they had nothing in return. After all the shirts had been passed out, Pastor Jed walked over to where the Jeffersons stood sipping their hot chocolate. I've noticed all the gifts you've given out. What was in them? Dora smiled. Just shirts. I realized so many men and boys had no one to sew for them, so I made twenty shirts in different sizes. They're not fancy, but they are clean and new and have no holes. Jed grinned. I wish I'd known, so I could have used you as an example in my sermon tonight. I'd rather no one said anything, Doris said. It's just my way of giving back to a community that has made me feel like one of them from the day I arrived. I thank you for loving your community so much, Jed said to Doris, before turning to Andrew. I hope you realize what a gem of a wife you've got here. Doris blushed, looking down. I don't know about that. I do. With that, Pastor Jed moved on to talk to other people. On the drive home, Andrew cleared his throat. Pastor Jed is right. I married a virtual stranger because I needed a wife since I couldn't stand the thought of a winter alone with no one beside me. I had no idea what a wonderful person I was marrying. Someone I can trust with everything inside me. The word trust had Doris in tears. Do you mean it? You can finally trust me? I've known I could trust you for a long time, he said. I should have told you, but I didn't want to bring it up. It's all water under the bridge now. Thank you. No, thank you. I didn't just wake up and decide to trust you one day. Instead, I watched you and the things you do. The way you help others and give of yourself completely. There's no woman in the world I would choose over you, she said. Well, other than Nelida, Doris said. I loved Nelida with my whole heart and soul, Andrew said softly. 
but she's my past and you're my present and future. You may not have been my first love, but you're my forever love. I love you with everything inside me, Doris. Doris blinked, trying to stem the flow of tears. I love you too, Andrew. Never having dreamed those words would be spoken to her, Doris felt as if she was floating on air. Thank you for accepting me despite my lie. When they woke on Christmas morning, Doris went into the kitchen to fix breakfast. She didn't think Margaret should have to cook on Christmas Day. As she walked past the parlor, she saw a huge piece of furniture in it. She walked inside to look and ran her fingers over the beautifully finished wood. It was an armoire, and it was something she desperately needed. All of her dresses would hang beautifully in it. Andrew walked up behind her. Merry Christmas, he said as he wrapped his arms around her waist. Oh, thank you, Andrew. Merry Christmas to you as well. She turned in his arms and expressed her gratitude with a soft kiss. I have gifts for you as well. He nodded. I know. Let's get our bread baked and I'll get the milk ready so we can go deliver to town. I was going to make a special breakfast, she said softly. Let's just eat with Margaret like we do every day. Dora smiled and nodded. He was right. There was no reason for her to do extra work on Christmas. She hurried into the kitchen to put the bread in to bake, happy that at this time of year, there was no need to put it in the cellar. The whole house was cold until the fire was started. The bread was baked, and the butter was churned before Andrew came inside from milking. He helped her wrap each loaf of bread in cloth, and the two of them headed to town to deliver the milk, bread, and butter. In the dining room of the boarding house, they realized there were very few people eating that morning. Most had chosen to do other things than make Margaret work. I'm sorry that you have to work on Christmas. Dora said as Margaret hurried over to fill their coffee cups. I knew what I was getting into when I opened my business, Margaret said with a smile. Doris handed her friend a package she'd wrapped a few days before. Margaret turned it over in her hands. Finally, she untied the string and found the new dishcloths Doris had painstakingly sewn for her. I noticed your others were getting worn out. I thought having a few more would be perfect for the boarding house. Thank you. Margaret smiled sweetly. You always think of everything. Hurrying to the kitchen, Margaret came out with their breakfast. I'll be around to refill coffee, she said as she disappeared again. I love my armoire, Doris told Andrew, between bites. I've never owned anything quite so lovely. I wish I could say I made it, but I don't have the skills to make something quite so beautiful. I hired Mr. King, our local furniture maker, and I told him what I wanted. What did you trade? she asked. He shook his head. I paid full price for once. I didn't even think about trading. Doris gaped at him for a moment. He'd paid for something, and she'd never seen him do that. He tithed to the church of course, but it was the only time she'd ever seen him part with his money. I can't believe you did that. Why not? I love you. Money is important, yes and I hope to leave this earth with a good sum for Fiona, but you're more important. You are my wife, and the woman I love. Of course I'm willing to spend money on you. You really do love me. Although she hadn't disbelieved him the night before, knowing he'd spent a tidy sum of money on her for Christmas made the truth truly sink in. I told you I do. I don't say things like that without meaning them. I know but it didn't strike me until you paid money for something for me. He chuckled. There's no reason not to spend a little on someone I love. Doris knew the armoire had cost more than a little, but she wasn't about to argue. I can't wait to get home so you can see the presents I made for you. When they got home, they brought Storm into the house with them and went straight to the parlor. Doris fetched the presents she'd hidden under a table in there and handed him three separate parcels. Looking down, he frowned. I only got you one thing. Trust me, the thing you got me has a much higher value. 
I made all of these. Andrew first opened a shirt and smiled happily. Mine are all falling apart. I noticed, which is why I made the shirts for people around town. She'd already passed out baskets of treats she'd made for people which included jerky, cookies, jam, and other sundry things. He opened the second to find a different color shirt. Now I have one for every day and one for church. That's what I was thinking when I made them. I will probably continue to make men's shirts as I have been for people in town who need them. I think that's a great idea. I'm just using some of the credit we have at the store, which is getting to be a lot. Doris wanted it to be clear she wasn't spending actual money on the materials. You could use real money if we ran out. Andrew looked down at the third gift in his hands and was surprised at how heavy it was. You made this as well? I did. She waited as he opened it, hoping he would be as happy to sleep under something that was theirs as she was. When he unwrapped the quilt he smiled. We need something warmer for the winter and this is perfect. He reached out and grasped her hand in his. It's been almost a year since Nelita passed on. I never thought I'd find someone I could have feelings for after she was gone. But here you are. I thank God every day for you and for Fiona taking the initiative to find me a wife. He pulled her to him and onto his lap. Christmas is special with you here. Christmas is always special, but I'm happy if I make any day better for you. I wanted to talk to you about the pastor's sermon last night, he said. It seemed strange to her that he'd pulled her onto his lap to talk about a sermon. All right. One of the widows in town died last night. I heard about it this morning at the boarding house while you were delivering your bread. Oh no. She had a daughter who was 14, and the girl has no family around here. It's all back east. How would you feel about adopting her? It would only be for a few years but you would have a child you could call your own. I love that idea. Let's go get her. Are you certain? he asked. Taking on a child is a huge responsibility. You should take a moment to think about it. Doris counted to thirty in her head. There, I took a moment. Let's go get her. Andrew laughed. She's with the pastor and Hannah right now but I'm sure they'll be pleased to find someone who wants her. Out in the wagon, she couldn't get there fast enough. What's the girl's name? she asked. Honoria. Her mother was widowed on the trail, and she's been sickly since. I'm not at all surprised she passed. Doris frowned. I'll make sure she's taken good care of. I know you will. When they got to the church, where the pastor still lived with his wife and child, Doris jumped off the wagon instead of waiting for Andrew to come around and get her. The only thing she'd felt was missing in her life was a child, and now she would have one, thanks to Andrew's kindness. When they entered the church, things were quiet. The Scots lived in a small portion of the church, but everyone entered through the sanctuary when they arrived. Andrew called out, Pastor Scott. Jed came hurrying into the room. Yes? I was told Honoria is with you. Are you trying to find her a home? Jed nodded. We'll keep her until someone is ready to adopt her. Dora stepped forward. We're hoping to adopt her. Oh, come and meet her then. Jed seemed surprised to have already found a home for the orphan, but he seemed happy about it. Doris and Andrew followed Jed into the far part of the church and went into the home where Jed and his family lived. Hannah was holding a girl and patting her back. I know things will work out for you. She looked up and her eyes met Doris's. Doris mouthed the words, we want her, and Hannah's face lit up. Honoria, I want you to meet Andrew and Doris Jefferson. They want to adopt you. Hannah's voice was calm as the girl looked at the older couple. Why do you want me? Honoria asked. I couldn't even keep my mother alive. How long did you have to take care of her? Doris asked, knowing her background would help with the girl. Since Pa died on the trail. 
I grew a garden this year, and I cooked whatever meat anyone was willing to spare. I, I hate that I killed her. Doris shook her head. You didn't kill her. She stayed alive as long as she could for you. I took care of my mother from the time I wasn't much older than you until a little more than a year ago when she passed. You did? I did. And I'd love to take you in. I'm not sick, and we can be a real family. Anuria nodded and got to her feet. Thank you Pastor Jed. Mrs. Scott. Hannah smiled. If you need to talk, remember, we're here. Anuria, through her sadness and guilt, seemed to be genuinely happy she wouldn't spend her life being a burden on the pastor and his wife. Thank you for taking me in, she said softly as she got into the back of the wagon. Dora smiled. I spent all the years I could have been marrying and having a family taking care of my mother. I'm so happy that I'll have a child now, even if she is mostly grown. Anuria smiled. You really want me, don't you? I do. With everything inside me. Andrew and I will be the best parents we can possibly be. Looking over at Andrew, Doris felt that her life was finally complete. Now she had a daughter to help raise, and another who was already going to supply grandchildren. Was it possible for life to get better? Taking Andrew's hand, Dora said a silent prayer, thanking God for putting Andrew, and now Anuria, into her life. The words could never be enough though. She was in love and raising a daughter. Life couldn't be more perfect.